Shalom and welcome back to Che Languages. I've actually had this video idea for almost a year now and just had the PowerPoint sitting there, but I finally decided it's time to pick it up. Today, the Iberian Peninsula has many languages and dialects both in Spain and in Portugal. With the exception of Basque, however, all of these dialects on these maps are descended from Latin due to the time Iberia spent as a Roman colony under the name Hispania, where Spain comes from. However, as linguistically diverse as the Iberian Peninsula is today, it is no match for pre-Roman Spain, a time when potentially five, four at least, completely unrelated language families are spoken across such a small geographic area. So today we're going to talk about these language families, and one of them will be covered by a special guest, Yala Matrilim. A forgotten civilization once inhabited the region now known as Andalusia and the Algarve, long before the Phoenicians, Romans or Arabs. Back when there was a gulf near modern-day Cadiz, there was the Tartessian civilization, spanning over much of southern Iberia with texts from the civilization showing up in all the dark red areas. The Tartessians owe their name to the ancient Greeks, who gave them the name Tartessos for unknown reasons. In ancient Greece, Tartessos was a semi-mythical city and or civilization mentioned to be beyond the Pillars of Hercules, now known as the Straits of Gibraltar, and at that time it was the edge of the known world. Some also hypothesize that a city mentioned in the Tanakh called Tarshish may also be the site of Tartessos, as there are many references to the city throughout the Hebrew Bible, most notably in the book of Yonah, where Yonah himself is mentioned to have attempted to get a ship to Tarshish. Despite the semi-mythical status, we definitely know that a civilization existed in this area, whether they call themselves Tartessos or not. And that's the thing, we don't know. Their language is still today unclassified. There are various theories to what it may have been. A popular but not accepted theory is that it was a Celtic language, but many Celtic scholars themselves actually dispute this, looking more towards their culture as evidence that they were not Celtic. They could also possibly have been Iberians, as they neighboured them and shared a very similar Phoenician-inspired script, called the Southwest Script by Linguists. Some scholars have also put forth the theory that Tartessian could have been Amazigh or Semitic, making it an Afro-Asiatic language. The most solid theory for now, however, is that it's an isolate. We indeed have a number of inscriptions from the Tartessians, though most of them are rather short. And shown in the top right is the Southwest script with an attempt to prescribe phonemes to them, reverse engineered from Phoenician. This attempt was made by Spanish linguist Rodriguez Ramos, and as you can see, he proposes that it's actually a sort of syllabary slash alphabet hybrid, which seems strangely impractical to me, but with this system, Ramos has translated the stela above to this literal letter-by-letter -letter transcription, and a proposed reconstructed form of what it might have sounded like. Sadly, we have no translation for what it possibly could have meant, nor can we really draw any cognates with other languages from them either. Perhaps somewhere there is a Tartessian Rosetta Stone waiting to be discovered, with Phoenician or Ancient Greek beside it, but for now, the Tartessian language, like the civilization, remains a huge mystery in linguistics. We do, however, know a lot more about our next language family. For Aquitanian, we can actually use a flag. Shown on the map here is the historical extent of Aquitanian, sometimes called Vasconic and contains two languages according to linguists, Aquitanian and Proto-Basque, also called Vascones. However, many believe Vascones and Aquitanian to be one and the same language merely a dialect continuum over the region that forms the ancient Basque language. Basque is unique today for being the only remaining Paleo-European language, that is, pre-Indo-European, in all of Europe. If there is one thing to take away from this video, it's that the Romans were fairly good at ethnically cleansing regions that are responsible for the decline of every Paleo-European civilization in Europe, the reason why none exists today, except for Basque. Many propose that the reason for this is because the Basque country is both mountainous and deciduous. Effectively, the geography of the region protected them from being wiped out. Despite this, the Aquitanian language, which was spoken mainly on the other side of the Pyrenees and in modern-day France, was obliterated by the Romans, leaving only the Vascones language behind, which would become Basque later. Although the Romans would lead to their demise, the Aquitanians across the Pyrenees adopted the Latin script and managed to leave us a small amount of vocabulary which compares nicely with both Proto-Basque and modern Basque cognates. Here is a list of some that were found on bilingual funerary stelae, the latest dating to 400 CE. Though it's not exactly known when the language died, it's estimated to have been at some point during the early Middle Ages, after the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. 
though it's likely it could have died before this point as the only records this late consist of people's names and place names. There isn't a lot more to say about Aquitanian apart from the fact that it's amazing that Basque managed to somehow survive into modern day. Uh, but now I'm going to pass the video on to a long time friend of the channel, a friend of mine, and a fellow lover of historical linguistics. Take it away, Linking. Hello and shalom to everyone here. To start, Celtic groups lived in the Iberian Peninsula from the end of the Bronze Age, about 900 BC, until they were subsumed by the Romans in about the 1st century BC. During that time, there were many cultures around them, including the Tartessans and Iberians, but this Ibero-Celtic group, also called Hispano-Celtic or Celt-Iberian, was the strongest of them all when Rome came in and ate the Mediterranean for breakfast. We have a lot of writings from them. They had their own writing system, which is noticeably and unsurprisingly Phoenician slash Punic in nature. But there is some argument of whether or not it's from Phoenician directly, or if it was influenced by the Greek alphabet as well. Now, there hasn't been much discussion about the Celtic languages as a whole on Che's channel, or my channel for that matter. But that's not for no reason. Not only are the Celtic languages mostly dead, but the general consensus of understanding how they relate to one another and how they developed isn't really well understood. In general, the Celtic languages are divided between the insular and the continental. Insular being the ones that developed on the British Islands, and continental being the ones spoken on mainland Europe. As you can see from this map, Celtic languages used to be spoken from Anatolia all through Central and Western Europe, but today they're a mere shadow of their former selves. Only the insular Celtic languages survived the Middle Ages, and it's important to remember that Breton came to Brittany from Cornwall in the 9th century AD. This would mean that there are no living languages that are closely related to our Celtiberian. Until you learn to mind your P's and Q's. Let me explain. There is another proposed way to divide Celtic languages. One that is less popular, so take it with a pinch of salt, but it splits them into two groups based on who moved away when and who kept, quote, older structures longer. This way of splitting the Celts leaves us with P languages being the, quote, newer Gallic and Britonic, and Q languages being the, quote, older Celt Iberian and Gaelic claiming that they left earlier and therefore have older ways of saying words. I don't know, pinch of salt, I could see it going both ways. Now getting to the good stuff. How did these thriving Hispano-Celtic peoples affect how people spoke even as they started learning Latin? Well, for one, place names, or toponyms to use the linguistic term. There's a whole Wikipedia article with some of these, link in the description. Most of these are in Galatia, which was a very Celtic place for a very long time. One that sticks out to me is the Lemia River, from the Celt-Iberian word Lima, which means flood. This word is a cognate with the Welsh word Lyf, which also means flood. There's also Windius, the name of a tall mountain range, from the Celt-Iberian window, meaning white. Finally, there's a town called Nemetobriga. Nemeto means sacred, but it was also related to the name of a Celtic deity and of a Celtic peoples who lived on the Rhine. And Briga means fort, so Nemeta Briga means sacred fort. It also makes sense that these places would simply retain their original Celtic names. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You don't need to rename everywhere you go, and usually toponyms are the most likely thing to remain from a long extinct language, as this can be seen all over the world. Apart from these place names, a lot of plant names in Spanish come from Celtiberian. Alamo is white poplar from Celtiberian. Berro is watercress, again, from Celtiberian. Brezzo is heather, also from Celtiberian. The list goes on. Clearly, I only made it to be alphabetically. And this makes perfect sense. When people come to a new place with different foliage, they tend to just use whatever word the people who are already there call it. There are many other types of words in Spanish that came from these Hispano-Celtic languages. Some verbs, a few adjectives, but the pattern I saw in general was that place names and plants are your best bet for finding a Celtic word that snuck into modern Spanish. We also know that at least two distinct Celtiberian languages existed, one mainly in Galicia and one in the rest of Celtic inhabited Iberia. However, that's all I have to say about Celtiberian today and as much as there is to know really, so I'm going to pass the video back on now and conclude this section.
Thank you for having me, Che. Back to you. Thank you, Lin King. More about him at the end of the video. For now, we turn our eyes to the east coast of Spain, where the Iberians lived. Although we generally call all the Paleo-Hispanic languages Iberian, Iberian can also specifically refer to a language family on the east coast, stretching from modern-day Catalonia all the way down to Almeria. The language is still officially unclassified, though many linguists are starting to call Iberian its own language family. There are some theories that it may be related to Proto-Basque. The most solid evidence for this comes with similarities in the numerical system. However, Iberian proper names are vastly different, sharing no link, and the question is still officially unanswered. Iberian disappeared from the written record around the 1st century CE, as the Romans tightened their grip on Hispania. However, the Spanish linguist Menedes Pidal made a claim that it may have survived as a spoken language in the rural areas all the way into the Visigothic period in the 6th to 7th century CE. On the topic of the written language, Iberian was written in two discernible scripts. Though both are closely related and ultimately directly descended from the Phoenician script, as most of the Phoenician colonies in Iberia were in the same place as the Iberians. The, these two scripts are known as the Southeastern Iberian script and the Northeastern Iberian script, and as you can see, they are both very similar in practice. Some sources also refer to them as Meridional and Levantine, respectively. The distribution of these scripts has been found to have been within these approximate boundaries. And here are some examples of inscriptions with both of these scripts, uh, northeastern being in the northeast of the screen, and likewise southeastern being located at the bottom. Furthermore, a more Hellen Hellenized script referred to as Greco Iberian has also been identified, shown here, but it is much more rare. Sadly for us, there is yet to be a translation or even an agreed upon transliteration of any of these texts. Even the reconstructed proper names and numbers are just proposals and cannot be confirmed with certainty to be the same way as linguists think it sounded. For now, however, we're going to talk about the last language on this list. Our final Paleo-Hispanic language on our list today is a language called Lusitanian, shown here on the map, with another map showing the distribution of texts discovered. Lusitanian is another language on this list that is still half classified. Half because we know it's Indo-European, but we just don't know which branch. Some say the obvious answer is Celtic, but there is heavy evidence against this, and it is theorised that the Lusitanians arrived in the Iberian Peninsula long before the Celts, being the first Indo-Europeans in the area. There is also another theory that tries to classify the Lusitanians as actually being an Italic group, meaning that they would be closer related to the Romans that would later subjugate them than the neighbouring Celts. But this is still unclear. For now, they are simply just Lusitanian. Even though linguists continue to insist that it must be part of another branch instead of being its own like Albanian or Armenian. Like many of the languages slash language families on this list, the Romans did a pretty good job of both eradicating and assimilating the people, meaning we do not have a lot of evidence to work with and only a list of toponyms and stone inscriptions remain to let us know that they even existed in the first place. However, unlike Iberian or Tartessian, we do have a full translated sentence which we will look at soon. But first, the name Lusitanian itself comes from what the Romans called the region, Lusitania, and it is still sometimes used today to mean Portugal. Lusophone, for example, means Portuguese speaking in the same way a Hispanophone country means a Spanish speaking country. The Romans named it after the Lusitani tribe. However, it is unknown if they called themselves this or if Lusitani is just a corruption of another name. Lucky for us, however, Lusitanian was written in the Latin script, unlike some other languages on this list, meaning we know almost exactly how it would have sounded. Here is an example of a text found at Arroyo de la Luz in Estremadura, España. From a research paper I found online, link in the description, it states that this inscription is incomplete and due to it being completely in Lusitanian, we don't know the translation. However, we do know that it probably had a religious nature to it given the location it was found and similar texts of Lusitanian that exist. For example, the one translated sentence of Lusitanian that we do have thanks to a bilingual Latin Lusitanian text is the following. Oilam telebopala indoporcom laibo comayam icona loimina oilam useam treparune indi taurum ifadem rewe. The translation is provided here, and as we can see, 
It is also a religious text, talking about offerings and sacrifices, as the names shown are all known to be Lusitanian deities. The fact that we have an entire sentence reconstructed, unlike the other languages we have talked about today, really fascinate, fascinates me, as it's possible to know what the language sounded like. Hopefully, more texts will be discovered, so we can try to reconstruct the language even more. And maybe even the same could be said for Tartessian, Iberian, Celtiberian, and Aquitanian someday too. However, we are going to conclude this video now. That's all for today's video. We've covered all the languages of pre-Roman Iberia, excluding so-called colonial languages, which consist of Ancient Greek and Phoenician slash Punic, which were spoken exclusively in colonies set up by both of the ancient superpowers. Once again, I urge you to check out Linking's channel. We had a collaboration almost two years ago when this channel was much, much smaller. His channel is more focused on certain linguistic shower thoughts, more or less, but his older videos are very focused on etymology and he has a great series of videos on historical linguistics. Most of the videos are him sitting in front of a camera and having some simple editing over the video, but there is a lot of value in the words he is saying, and I've definitely learned a lot of interesting facts about our own words, lots of historical languages I never knew about, and a lot about the history and development of our writing systems from his videos. A special thank you once again to Linking for talking about Celtiberian, and thank you for watching. For now, that's all, and I will see you in the next video. Yalla bye!